Uh, welcome to the uh, chapter on logistic regression and classification. So I want to classify a variable that's uh, one or zero, logistic regression, and welcome to its applications in predictive analytics. So a quick little general introduction about pre predictive analytics. Uh, we talked about multiple regression in the last segment. Here we're going to talk about logistic regression. So essentially I've got an input and an output so x are my input variables, typically high dimensional. And I want to try and predict an output variable. And I do that by finding a function f that takes x to, uh, takes x to y. And there's a whole bunch of examples, uh, internet consumer demand ones, map mapping problems, pricing problems, healthcare problems. And I think by now you realize that applications are, uh, are endless. Okay, so let's, let's talk about classification as opposed to uh, straight regression. So by classification, we just mean we want to predict a categorical variable. And for ease of simplicity, let's, let's just think about predicting a variable that goes 1 or 0. So we can't use uh, regression in its ordinary form because uh, y is either 1 or 0. What we really want to know is what's the probability that y equals 1 given some input variable. And again, we've got a list of predictors just like in multiple regression. So there's uh, endless problems, millions of problems where you want to do logistic regression, sports betting, win or lose problems, uh, lots of healthcare ones, uh, decisions to, to buy or not to buy, or to click through on a Google, on a Google ad or not, uh, and lots of credit risk uh, problems too. And again, the goal is quite simple. Let's try and predict the probability that y equals 1, given a certain combination of our x variables, class, the so-called classification problem. So there's a typical problem. Uh, Capital One, one of the companies that uh, uh, looked at default data credit risk, uh, how do I predict uh, FICO scores as well? FICO, another company that looked at these types of problems, how do I predict uh, customer credit as a bunch of variables? So here's our formula for logistic regression. So y is essentially an indicator or dummy variable. It takes value 0, 1. x is our list of predictor variables. And we're going to model the probability that y equals 1 as some function uh, of parameters beta 1. I could, I could introduce an intercept here too. I could have a beta 0 if I, if I wanted an intercept. Some function of beta 1 x all the way down to beta p uh, x p. And again, we know that it's a probability, so we know we know that that f goes between zero to one, and of course, what's a what's a typical function here that will that will uh, do that mapping for us? And in neural network terminology, uh, this is called an activation function. Well, there's more than one that would do it. Uh, one that would do it would be the normal CDF, would be that would be the phi function, and that would lead to something that was being popular in economics, uh, would lead to to probit models. Uh, there's also another class of models called Tobit models, but the, 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 the class we'll look at today uh, is essentially the logit models, uh, where we look at the function uh, e to the x over 1 plus e to the x, or, or basically 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. And that's a natural activation function to take us from uh, a linear combination of predictors into a probability that goes from 0 to 1. So another way of saying that uh, if I invert f, if I take f over the other side, another way of saying that is, is I look at the log odds. Uh, I look at log of p over 1 minus p, and essentially I run a regression on that. Uh, and as x goes up by 1 unit, so if I increased x1 by 1 unit, my log odds would go up by, my left-hand side would go up by beta 1 hat units, as I've estimated beta 1. Now, because it's discrete data, uh, I don't have a normal distribution. I've got, I've got a binomial distribution. Uh, and again, the command used for fitting this is called the GLM command, generalized linear models. And there's a whole bunch of other options too. So there's a whole bunch of possible models that you could run. You could run a Poisson regression if I had count data or a negative binomial regression. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities here. Here I'm just putting in two variables, x1 and x2. In general, I'd have multiple variables. And again, I can transform my x variables. I can add interaction terms. Uh, I can do all the other things that we've done with multiple regression. 
Uh, so here's here's a little example, simple example. Does the Las Vegas point spread predict whether or not the favorite wins in a bunch of NBA games? So we'll do it. We'll do a simple uh, uh, example. Uh, turquoise the favorite wins. Uh, purple the favorite does not win. Uh, so most of the time the favorite wins. Sometimes sometimes they don't. What happens if I run this regression? Uh, spread minus one means I'm taking out the intercept. So uh, if the point spread is zero, uh, essentially I'm assuming it's 50-50. And again, we can see an estimate on a log odd scale uh, of how much does a one point change in the point spread affect your estimate of the probability of the favorite winning. And again, on the log odd scale, uh, it's at about 0.156. Uh, take the ratio of these two, I get, I get a, a z-score or a t-score of 11, so it's highly statistically significant. Uh, the Vegas point spread is good at predicting the uh, uh, predicting the probability of winning. And again, if it goes up by one, uh, there's what, about an 18% chance change in the, uh, uh, in the odds. So if I go back to my logit model, the probability of the favorite winning given the point spread is e to the beta x over 1 plus e to the beta x. So for example, if I plug in 8 or a 4, uh, if I see a pretty heavy favorite, uh, the win probability there is 77%, and the win probability here is, uh, is only 65%. And again, I'm just plugging in for my beta at the 0.156. And so it's sort of the obvious fact, but clearly the bigger spread means a higher chance of winning. But what's nice with the religious regression is I can actually put probabilistic numbers to those as well. Uh, I was lucky enough uh, at a stats meeting once to meet Bill Benter, a uh, very famous guy uh, who built a big logistic regression with like 80 variables for predicting uh, which horse was gonna win a uh, horse race. Uh, again, if you click on the link up here, there's a hyperlink to Bloomberg. Uh, so Bill Benter, uh, big use of logistic regression in horse racing betting. Uh, Kegel, there's a data set up there with Hong Kong horses. Uh, there's a whole bunch of variables. Uh, I played around a little bit. Uh, I tried a couple of logistic regression models. Again, that's the machine learning tool used to develop these uh, horse racing models. Uh, including win odds, so including uh, the odds created by the market is sort of important, it's a key variable, and you basically want to see what are the in inefficiencies relative to the win odds, so what what biases are there, are there that you can exploit, uh, and again, if you look at, uh, if you can, uh, if you can uh, blow the slide up a bit and see the, uh, see all the variables that we use, post position, jockey, uh, handicap weight, and the, the corresponding betas that go with it. So uh, horse racing prediction with a whole bunch of variables, uh, looking at conditional logic models for horse betting. And again, another example uh, with, again, if you look more, more closely, you'll see, the, uh, uh, you'll see the coefficients. I think we've talked about this before. So uh, back when we did sensitivity specificity uh, in, these, in these classification problems, you're typically, you know, how good will a model be? You typically plot this confusion matrix. Basically, what's the, what's the percentage of correct answers to sample size, uh, your true positive rate and false positive rates. Uh, here's a, an interesting 10 example. Uh, IBM has spent quite a bit of time developing AI toolbox for tennis. Uh, so I'm gonna look at, uh, look at a, a sort of tennis data. Uh, a whole bunch of players. Uh, how important are break points in tennis? You would think you would think very important. Uh, <clears throat> I've got 93 matches. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of variables. Uh, I'll even look at, at gender effects as well. So a quick look at what the data looks like. Uh, surface, gender, result, what round, what the players are. Uh, gives an example. And you can see... Uh, if you plot number of breakpoints won by each player, so player one versus player two, uh, it doesn't quite separate. Uh, but of course, you know the obvious fact: the more breakpoints you win, the, the higher the odds are of you winning. Uh, something called a support vector machine, which is very similar to uh, to logistic regression, 
uh, does its best to try and split these things out. <coughs> and again, the idea is uh, you can see how valuable these these breakpoints are. So uh, maybe training up the players to be more focused when it comes to breakpoints uh, uh, would benefit them. Again, if, uh, if I run a generalized linear model, uh, taking the intercept out, breakpoint of player one, breakpoint of player two, family equals binomial, uh, I can then basically uh, compute a, compute a uh, confusion matrix, and I can see uh, if I just classify uh, according to who's got the higher probability of winning, uh, my logistic regression model in this confusion matrix has got an 87% accuracy, which again shouldn't be too surprising. And again, you know, if I plot the the separating hyperplane that comes from logistic regression, I get I get something that looks like that. Uh, what do we find? Uh, you know, sort of obvious. Uh, the uh, the breakpoint uh, is uh, is significant, and but. The magnitude is sort of the bit that we get, right? So uh, just as a little model check, uh, if neither of the players win a breakpoint, the mo our model predicts a 50-50. Don't know which is the best player. <clears throat> if model three wins three breakpoints to zero, uh, our model says there's a 77% chance that that player is going to win. So uh, it sort of gives you an order of magnitude uh, effect. Uh, a women's match is less predictable. And it turns out that's the case. Uh, and again, from our model, by predictability, uh, the model with the lowest standard deviation about the regression line or about the regression is uh, is more predictable. And you can see that the box plot for, for women is slightly higher than that for men. So, uh, so that's another interesting finding, that women's matches are, are less predictable. OK, let me, let me finish with a very interesting example. Uh, so, uh, it's a New York Times LinkedIn study. Uh, so again, if you click on the link, the hyperlink here, uh, New York Times has a great website. Uh, it's even got a little interactive piece where you can you can uh, fill in your own data, and you can see how your probability curves change uh, according to your own data. Now, it was a study done by Link Gan, who was a data scientist at uh, at LinkedIn at the time. And there's a given data set, so there's already a, already a selection bias uh, for, uh, for the data that's already there. So it's 459,000 LinkedIn members uh, who worked in consultancy between 1990 and uh, 2010. And the, uh, the question is, is what's the odds of you becoming a uh, vice president or, uh, or, or get to the C-suite uh, of... Of the 459,000 members, about 64,000 members made it. So the underlying base rate is about, uh, you know, got a low probability of, uh, of making it up high in the corporation, one in, about, about one in seven. And the question is, is, you know, how can you improve that chance? And again, we're going to look at, I think, eight variables, educational background, gender, work experience, career trans, uh, uh, transitions, and education will do undergrad, grad as well, uh, business school, not business school. And again, the whole goal is just to run a big logistic regression to work out what's the probability to become an executive. And in the modern in the modern era of, of big data and, and these and these uh, machine learning techniques, what's interesting is that you really can look at these big data sets and you really can infer some very interesting patterns from them. So I think. Uh, uh, more transparency and more interesting to see what uh, I'm surprised more people don't look at more of these big uh, big data sets. So again, let me just remind you of logistic regression. This time we'll include an intercept. Uh, your log odds of becoming an executive is a bunch of eight variables. Uh, we want to work out your success probability. What are the what are the variables or features? Uh, which city, metro region? We're going to see that New York. Uh, if you're willing to work in New York, you've got a, you've got a bigger odds. Uh, we're going to assess the gender effect. Uh, we're going to assess the education effect. Uh, did it does it matter if you go to it, get an MBA from a top US program or not? Uh, we're going to look at your undergraduate type. Did you go to liberal arts? Uh, did you go to a to a top non US school? Uh, we'll look at that as well. 
And then work experience is interesting. So let, let's see you know, how the model loads on these things. Uh, does it matter how many companies you worked for? Does it matter how many jobs you've done? Does it matter if you jumped between industries or not? And then uh, does age, uh, what is the marginal effect of, of work experience uh, do for you? And so remember, it's a huge data set, 459,000 LinkedIn uh, CVs and uh, x rayables of which 64,000 people, of which one in seven became executives. And so we get all the beta hats. So you can see how your log odds uh, change. So for example, you can look at the relative changes. So you can look at years experience versus, uh, say for example, uh, whether you do an MBA or not. And so, you know, 1.16 is uh, what about uh, you know, 12 times, 13 times years experience. So you can see, uh, you know, getting, getting an MBA is maybe uh, in, in this 20-year in this, uh, period uh, was clearly a, a very good thing to do. Uh, oh, and you can see what's a bad thing to do. A bad thing to do is to jump between different uh, different industries. Oh, and you can also see that there's a there's a bias. Uh, there's a there's, there's a gender bias in the data set as well, which is also quite significant. And again, with these larger data sets, you can actually assess these. Uh, uh, you know, you know more objective, uh, more objective ways of, of assessing these things. Remember, these are numbers having controlled for other numbers. Uh, and the 0.28 will, will basically be a New York effect. So here's, here's, here's a bunch of, uh, of findings. As I, as I said before, uh, uh, you know, until you run the data, you don't, you don't see what, what happens. Uh, a top five MBA program uh, is equivalent to about 13 years of work experience. Uh, willingness to work in New York City over that period made a, made a big difference. And then working across different job functions like marketing and finance is good, but, but switching industries is actually a negative. Uh, why is that? Well, do you have to relearn a bunch of things or have you lost your network? Or uh, I'm not sure what the causal reason is, but uh, not good to switch industries, but good to work in different parts of the same industry. And so here's just three examples. Uh, as I said, if you go to the New York Times website, you can uh, you can plug your own data in, and you can see if you'd made slightly different choices, uh, what would have happened to your or what would happen to your probability of success. So, uh, and I'm sure all these three people here are are, are equally happy, but it's interesting to see uh, see what you would get. And I guess I guess I I, I guess I relate a little bit to uh, to person B. Uh, and you can see how the, the probability has changed 6%, 15%, and, and 63%. And so, you know, the winning, the winning strategy is really uh, top undergraduate program, top MBA, different job functions in one industry, and, you know, years experience, uh, you know, does help as well. Uh, now you could take this person that, uh, uh, that went to school in, uh, in England and you could redesign him uh, or her and try and increase his probabilities so uh, maybe they should have worked in one industry rather than two uh, maybe they should have come to the US earlier uh, maybe they should have uh, uh, worked for a few more companies in the same industry uh, maybe should go straight from London to New York uh, maybe different job functions uh, do different things in that same industry and maybe work a little bit harder uh, and so if you add up all these, uh, all these effects, uh, you can see that the 15% that you started can, uh, can be increased to a dramatic uh, 80%. So and I, hope, I hope you found that uh, a fun analysis at the end of today of logistic regression. Uh, logistic regression is one of the very important, uh, important uh, fields because it does classification. Uh, so don't forget uh, all the examples we looked at. MBA predictions, horse racing prediction, and uh, our LinkedIn study uh, are all uh, logistic regression problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, next time will be artificial intelligence and uh, deep learning.